somebody else has some. Those people who gave poinsettias, uh, please take them today. We're going to kind of clear them out because we're going to drop the temperature in the sanctuary and they won't survive. Thank you. We also do take a three of them. Really bad for you. Francis, do you want to join with that? The more the merrier. Seeing none other, let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the Almighty God. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wednesday. Know that you all had lots of fun with presents and stockings and tree and family and dinner. But it's still Christmas. Christmas goes from December the 25th till January the 6th. We call January the 6th Epiphany. When we remember the wise men who came and gave gifts to Jesus. So it's still Christmas, and the sanctuary still looks like it's Christmas, doesn't it? We have a Christmas tree, and there's all the poinsettias, and the, the bottom here is still white. White means we're celebrating. And here's this beautiful tree with all the decorations on it. And I was wondering if you knew why in church, probably at your home as well, we had Christmas trees. If you look outside, you can see out the windows. There's not a whole lot of green out there, is it? It's mostly bare branches because it's winter. And all the trees are going to sleep until the spring. But there are some trees that are green all year round, right? And we call them evergreens. And evergreens are green in the winter as well as in the spring. And they never they don't change their leaf color in the fall. They're always green. And those are trees like pines and cedars. That's what we make our Christmas trees out of, right? Christmas tree at home. Looks like that, pretty much, right? And it's green in the winter. And the reason people started taking in Christmas trees and decorating them at Christmas was because the way those trees were always green reminded them of the fact that God was always there for us, always faithful and present. God was never going to abandon us. Never, there was never going to be a time when God wasn't there. Just like there was never going to be a time when the tree wasn't green. And Christmas, especially, we remember how Jesus came to be with us. We remember that God is always faithful. So when you go home uh, and you see the Christmas tree, or when you see your Christmas tree next year, remember that it's there to remind you of how God is always there for you and always loves you. You think you can do that? Let's hold hands and pray. I will say a few words and you can say them. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for Christmas trees. Thank you for Christmas trees. That remind us of your faithfulness.
other with signs of peace.
gospel read and proclaimed, let us pray. Lord, we have come today to hear a word from you. No human word will do. We ask that you would clarify our thoughts and our hearts and make us able to hear what you're saying to us today. In Christ we pray. First reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 10 to 18. Hear the word of God. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. <clears throat> For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are, who are being tested. The grass weathers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Hymn is, or the psalm rather, is Psalm 148. And as we do, this side will read the unbolted text, and this side will read the bolted text. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the highest. Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. 
Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem, who were two years old or under, according to the time he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled, because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life from death. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in the dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called the Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. One of the weirder aspects of the Christian year is that the joy of Christmas Day is immediately followed by a set of fairly depressing feast days, all still within the 12-day Christmas season. For reasons we can talk about later if you're interested, Presbyterians don't observe most of them. But the day after Christmas is traditionally the feast day of Stephen, the first <coughs> martyr, whose death you can read about in the early goings of Acts. That's the day of the Greensleeve Carol, right? And good King Wenceslas looks out on the feast of Stephen, right? It's the day after Christmas. And around today, different people observe it on different days, uh, is the feast of what they call the Holy Innocents. Uh, which is when we remember the story that we just read about how Herod kills all the children under the age of two uh, to be sure that he's killed Jesus. He doesn't know what it means that Jesus is going to be a great king. He thinks it might mean that he's going to be replaced. He's worried it might threaten himself and his family. So he goes to these extreme, terrible lengths to try to be sure it can't happen. The order goes out, kill every boy under the age of two. So immediately after Christmas, we're faced with these two stories of weakness, of Stephen's death and then the death of these children. Joseph, we're told, is warned by an angel in a dream, and in order to escape the massacre, they flee to Egypt. They flee. They become refugees. It's not a message that any parent wants to hear, especially not parents of a young child. And it's ironic. Just a few minutes ago, we sang a Christmas carol, recalling how the angels sang hymns to God and the shepherds left their flocks to worship, and the wise men and sages traveled a long way to see him. God with us is now abiding. You have seen the infant light. It wasn't that long ago for Joseph either, under two years, and now nothing would do except to take this child who was also God and flee. <coughs> Why couldn't God do something else, something dramatic? He's just displayed a lot of power. Did he run out? Why couldn't he rescue Jesus and the other children openly? Christmas was a blazing display of God's love and authority. Why did it fade so quickly? <coughs> Maybe the answer is that all of history is a fairy tale. Or to put it a little more clearly, by God's grace, fairy tales reflect a vital, important thing about the world. There's a reason 
so many great thinkers. George MacDonald, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, to name a few, write fairy tales. A trick of people who want to be edgy and offensive and shock their Christian family members is to call the gospel a fairy tale. In some ways, they're more right than they know. Fairyland has rules. Did you know this? I bet you do. And the rules are not less important just because the place isn't real, what we call real. Here are a few of them. Number one, take advice from random old ladies. <laughs> Two, if someone asks you for food, give it to them. Three, pay extra attention to the weak and the powerless because they're probably something else in disguise. Or if you don't know what it is, don't eat it. And, oh yeah, if you're given a physically demanding job to do by a stranger, remember to use the least helpful tool for that job. If you're hauling water, choose the bucket with holes in it. If you're cutting trees, pick the rest of axe. Avoid anything gilded or bejeweled or precious, like your left pins on it, because it might. In other words, in Fairyland, the weakest, most apparently useless things are usually the strongest and the most powerful. That's the way it is in the kingdom of God, too. Fairyland follows God's rules. God has favored the weak from the beginning. After all, when he decided to make a covenant with a nation, he didn't pick one of the great empires of the world so that they would be his chosen people and he would be their God. Instead, he picked a family, a small, unremarkable family that grew into a small, unremarkable nation. And once he'd chosen them, he didn't make them into an enormously powerful empire, like maybe we would expect him to. They remained small and threatened from all directions by the great empires that at the time were gobbling up the smaller ones. But what he did give to this small nation was more valuable than anything the greater nations had. What he had promised from the beginning was through that family he would bless all families of the earth. And he does so by being born among them himself to rescue us from all the tyranny of sin and death, from which, as one of the great prayers of the church says, neither human beings nor angels were able to set us free. We remembered on Tuesday, on Christmas Eve, that when God came to save us, he didn't come in at the head of angel armies or in open power as the king of the universe, though he could have done this. Instead, he comes as a little baby. He came in weakness and powerlessness, just like any other baby. The God who created the universe couldn't walk. He couldn't feed himself. And when some regional ruler on a power trip threatened his life, he relied on his parents to get him out of there and flee with him to Egypt. The flight into Egypt isn't random, though, and it isn't an accident. Jesus Christ is God, but he is also fully, completely human, born, as the scriptures say, of the house of David, born as an Israelite, one of God's chosen people, through whom God promised from the beginning to bless the whole world. He is truly God and truly human, and this part of his early life echoes the early life of Israel. They also fled into Egypt, not to escape a homicidal ruler, but to escape a famine. And while they were there, they also experienced a similar threat to their young boys. And at the end of their time there, they left Egypt by divine command. The Israelites through Moses and the plagues, and Jesus by another angelic command to Joseph. God's whole history, in other words, of his chosen people becomes focused and intensified into one person. 
history, all of history, is narrowed into a point, and that point is Jesus, a baby who is picked up and carried into Egypt, and then into Nazareth, because he couldn't go himself, a baby who is both God and human, a baby who has come to save us. The Hebrews passage we read is delighted by all of this. You can feel the joy coming out of every line of it. In Jesus' full humanity, God became our brother and shared the same weakness that we have, the same vulnerability, for instance, to injustice, to the whims of corrupt rulers, so that by his death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. I mentioned earlier that if you ever find yourself in fairyland, it's wise to pay attention to the seemingly unimportant things, to frogs and to beggars and to nondescript old ladies, because chances are things are not what they seem. And I told you that the weakest things are usually the most powerful because fairyland tells the truth about God and what God does. Jesus doesn't avoid the slaughter of the children in order to avoid death, but so that he might die at a later time, so that he might redeem from death not only the children of Bethlehem, but the whole world. An ancient preacher once said when he thought about what happened in Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, he said, Hell grasped a corpse and met God. Hell seized earth and encountered heaven. He thought about it as a kind of divine mousetrap. Jesus' humanity is the cheese, and Jesus' divinity destroys all of hell. God becomes one of his chosen people, contains in his body and humanity all of the history of God with the world, becomes himself Israel, makes our weakness his weakness, suffers with us all of the indignities and grief of life, suffers death itself, and then, because he is also God, by enduring death breaks its power. The seemingly weak person of Jesus Christ shatters the power of death and sin when he rises from the dead, and therefore also frees us from the fear of these things. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, hell, where is your victory? At this point in the sermon, pastors are often encouraged to make an application or some kind of call to action or something practical that people can take home with them. But you know, I think sometimes that's a temptation to be resisted. A lecture or a guilt trip or even a reasonable exhortation loses its power in the face of the harshness of life's realities. What do you say on the day the church remembers the slaughter of children? What do you say in the face of modern realities no less heinous or private tragedies no less painful. In these situations, friends, the gospel is not something you have to perform. It's enough just to open your hands and receive it. It's a gift for you, not a to-do list. In Jesus Christ, God becomes a baby, a refugee, a wandering preacher who suffers hunger and thirst and uncertainty and temptation strained family relationships, and exhaustion, and betrayal, and even death itself. And because he has experienced those things, Hebrews says, he is here for us who experience them as well. Maybe we can learn one more thing from fairy tales. Catastrophe is always followed by joy. Herod's slaughter of children, the flight into Egypt, the temptation, the betrayal, the suffering and death of the cross, all of these things are followed by resurrection, by the breaking of the power of death, and by the redemption of the world. 
God experiences with us our pain and weakness and suffering and incorporates them all into his own person so that in the end we may also share in his triumph and his joy and his eternity. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than anything we could ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen.
especially thank you for being born among us as one of us, to save us from all our sorrows. We praise you for establishing your church on the firm rock of yourself, for promising that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, for never leaving yourself without a witness. We pray for those churches that are threatened, for those who face the threat or reality of persecution, that you would give them courage and joy, that the blood of the martyrs would be, as always, the seed of the church, that you would bring them peace and flourishing. And Lord, we also pray for those churches that are not so much threatened with persecution as with complacency, that you would bring among us the joy of your spirit and wake us up and cause us to watch with you. We pray for this congregation that you love, for our community, our witness to the world, that you would cause us to be faithful and to bring your kingdom here as in the whole world. And we pray not just for the church, but for our nation and all the nations of the world. That where there is war, you would bring a just and honorable peace. <coughs> where there is fear, you would bring joy. That all leaders would rule for the good of their people and not for their own selfish gain. We especially pray this morning for Australia, for the fires there, and for those who have been affected by the various disasters and shootings in our own country. We pray for our own leaders, for our president and our governor, and all those who make and enforce our laws that you would give them wisdom. And Father, we pray for those who are dearest to us, for Glenn Hall and his family, and for those we name before you now in the silence <coughs> of our hearts. Lord God, we ask that you would heal the sick and accompany the dying, that you would comfort those who are suffering from family relationships, that you would give rest for the weary, and that you would soothe the anxious. We ask these things in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
bless this gift and bless those who have given it, so that both may go into the world to serve you and to fulfill your purposes for our community. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.